Welcome to This Week in Heresy, episode 26, The Spirit of Cooperation, with our guest via Skype, Chris Hockley. Hi, Chris. Welcome to This Week in Heresy. Hi, thanks for having me on, Gina. So why don't you introduce um, our listeners to you (laughs) and a little bit about um, your new ministry? You bet. Um, I am in my final year of uh, seminary here at the Pacific School of Religion. Um, I'm a United Methodist, uh, though I uh, have deep connections also with the UCC Church and uh, other uh, denominations and uh, interfaith as well. Um, so my new ministry is the foundaltar.com. Um, I'm really excited about it. Uh, the idea of the ministry is for it to be an online a uh, set of resources for spiritual uh, formation in particular and spiritual development. And uh, it is growing uh, to also have uh, a physical component as well. I'll be working with some uh, local churches to do small groups. Um, I really feel like I'm trying to resource churches themselves because I believe it's really important as a person of faith to be in a community of people of faith because it helps us discern uh, things a lot better. And so I, I really hope that, uh, it's an online resource that is for, uh, particularly small churches and small communities, uh, to, uh, more deeply explore spirituality, um, that backs up social action, if that makes sense. So it's, it's really designed to help people reflect theologically and spiritually about what they're doing. So I'm guessing this is primarily for clergy at this point. Um, actually, it's, uh, it's kind of in both in two ways. Uh, the le- I have a lectionary commentary on there, mm-hmm. um, so that's more geared toward clergy and those who will be preaching. But I'm also doing uh, devotionals, which is more geared to a lay uh, perspective. So um, I think there's a little something for everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, In that sense, I'm hoping that uh, it will speak both to uh, laity and clergy, uh, be a resource for clergy and be a place uh, for laity. I also really, uh, I mean, I'm trying to uh, begin to get content from a number of diverse voices. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping to uh, expand uh, the reach of diverse voices through the website. Um, An example of this is I just had a young woman uh, from South Dakota who wrote a a piece of poetry, um, have that, uh, put that up on the site as a devotional. So my hope is to uh, expand the voices of lay persons as well as a part of this, because I question the uh, lay clergy gap we sometimes have Mm -hmm. uh, in the church. Um, I think there's something important about uh, being clergy and being lay, but I think that too often uh, lay people are not given credit for being able to think theologically. And uh, some of the most, uh, my most, uh, insightful teachers over the years have been lay persons. And I think uh, laity are so important to the church and so important that I I hope that their voice gets out as a part of this project as well. So what inspired you to start this? Because, you know, I'm I'm hearing like you, you've been inspired by laity ministry, lay ministry. And, but you know, what, what else motivated you to get this resource together? (laughs) I I think that's a good question. Um, It comes from a few different directions. I I really have a passion for spiritual development in general. And I think uh, particularly in the progressive church, there is uh, been a lack of talk about what kind of spiritual practices can help us to recharge in the midst of social action, in the midst of uh, working for justice. And I think that connecting those two things is really important. And uh, I became fascinated with technology as a spiritual tool when I worked in campus ministry in Iowa. Um, what I quickly discovered is that how the students I was, uh, was working with were, uh, 
connecting with one another and uh, all of a sudden started discovering that there are some real advantages to having an online presence. And unfortunately, what happens in small churches is they just don't have time or personnel to do the kind of work around both spiritual formation and online resources Mm -hmm. um, that are there. And, you know, when you, you have a small church, most of the time you have an individual pastor who is a one person show. Um, and I really want those uh, pastors to be able to have resources as well as uh, to be able to uh, provide uh, spiritual formation without having it be just one more thing they have to do on, right, right. on a, on a weekly basis. Um, because in the end, they're already overtaxed, especially our clergy and small ter- churches are already overtaxed. So yeah, <laughs> uh, I can totally understand that. One. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm partially drawing on uh, an old Methodist model of the circuit riders, and I'm searching for community partners within this ministry so that three or four churches, hopefully at a time, can work together with me in this. And then they, I, I can uh, help resource them and be a spiritual formation person that otherwise small churches couldn't afford. Right. And then- that's a, that's a really great idea. I mean, there's there's been other I movements like I've seen some uh, there's recently been some movement in the pagan community to do similar um, kind of groups. Um, what are, are you thinking about what could happen in, in the negative sense? Because there are certain things like with some communities that, you know, they'll end up with drama or like, especially once money gets involved in these kind of endeavors, you know, it it gets sticky. And, you know, what, what are you doing to kind of mitigate that? And, you know, what, what kind of resources are there? Like, is, is it going to have a financial aspect to it at some point? Is it going to be 501c3? uh, The hope in the long run is we'll we'll go uh, the 501c3 route right now where I'm really trying to work out how that particular piece is going to, that's probably one of the most complicated things in dealing with a ministry like this is figuring out how that's going to work. And um, right now, in a lot of ways, it's a lot of figuring that out because right now it's a I'm a one man show doing (laughs) doing this and I don't want it to be that way. Um, I'm really seeking out with this. Part of the reason I want uh, to work within a group of churches is I think these type of ministries need to have uh, a sense of covenant and oversight as well. Mm -hmm. So you connect with, so the communities act uh, as a way of connecting and keeping you grounded uh, within the communities. Now, the challenge is picking the right communities to do this with because yeah. internal community drama can be really difficult. And yeah. uh, one of the challenges you always have when you work with ministry of like this is that you got to find churches whose personalities are about um, working with each other and not just simply uh taking everything for their own. You have to have a certain view of what Christianity means, I think, <laughs> mm-hmm. to work in one of these uh, what? Uh, situations. Right. What do you think that is? Uh, that's a tough question. <laughs> 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 I think I, I'll, I'll come at it from how I view it. So as I come at this, the way I view it is that I don't see – Churches even who are near each other competing with one another for parishioners. And I think that's a, a symptom of us, uh, of the church as a whole being concerned about losing membership, mm-hmm. uh, concerned about lo- the, uh, a, a downward trend in numbers. However, I see that actually as a, um, possibility for the church because the people I see in the pews right now are much more committed uh, to what is going on within the pews of of churches. So I think that if we can 
combine resources and say we can strengthen one another. Uh, even across the nominational line, say, you know, we can strengthen one another, then we're in the right uh, direction. Where we get into challenges when we start getting into territorial battles, you know. Right. Um, and quite frankly, I think that's the importance. Uh, I, I've never been kind of, I, I really am uh, interested in ecumenical work, but I, I'm not a, one of the people who says, I, I don't think we need to get rid of denominations. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think they're really important because people worship in different ways. People connect to the divine presence in different ways. And I think it's important to find homes within those. But I think there's a real possibility of connecting those different ways together and learning from one another. So uh, my hope is that this ministry uh, deepens the faith uh, of those involved by connecting them together and then making them more sound, not only in ecumenical uh, faith, but in their own tradition. I would hope uh, a UCC church who is a part of the found altar would become a better UCC church. I would hope a better a United Methodist church would become a better United Methodist church. I would hope a, a uh, any community that's a part of it, I would hope, would become more uh, connected from its own perspective and its own tradition. So I think that's really important Mm -hmm. and something we often miss in Christianity is the diversity is actually beautiful. Um, And and I think that's the thing. There's never been a such thing as a single Christianity. There's always been Christianities. Uh, And I think that that's really important uh, to celebrate that diversity that's why one of the things the stated uh goals i have is to really uh try to bring diverse voices one uh even that are not from the same uh theological viewpoint i am i really don't want the commentary in the long run to be a one man show. I don't want it to be all me. Uh, right now, unfortunately, most of it is all me, but we're, <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's the reality of starting something like this as you start with what you have. But um, right. we're slowly getting up uh, people who are going to, to work on it. And I'm hoping to expand guest commentators as times go along. Um, and I have some people who have expressed some interest in that. So that's great. Um, and we have one community partner right now. We're partnering with uh, Open Door United Methodist Church at the moment in Richmond, California. And uh, hopefully we'll be expanding to a couple other churches here soon. I'm in conversations with a few. Yeah, when, I, know, I know that's one conversation we've, we have we need to have because um, yeah. we, we, we've been meaning to schedule it, but life has gotten in the way. <laughs> um, Amazing how life has a tendency to do that. For real. And, you know, and... You know, when, as you were talking, I was thinking about something I wrote and probably have talked about like a bazillion times, but I've wrote, written about it recently is that, you know, there's a beauty, beauty in our diversity and that that diversity doesn't negate our commonality. And, you know, I think I, I think this is a beautiful idea. And I think if we can get to a point where we can get we can recognize that, yes, we have denominational and religious differences, yet we still have that commonality that can make us work together. Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I get really tired of hearing um, about, you know, us getting into little tiny battles, you know, over denominational lines or little tiny battles over the, the minus, uh, minutest piece of doctrine. <laughs> well, I, while I believe doctrine is important, I also think relationship is way more important than doctrine in the long run. Um, and but I do think we we need to come to the table as who we are. Um, and I, and I think sometimes we end. Uh, I've seen uh, the ecumenical movement make the mistake of uh, denying the wholeness of who each member of the group is. And I really. I think that's important is that we all bring all of ourselves to the table so that we can learn what each other has gift wise. And so we can, you know, disagreement's an important part of it, too. You know, I don't learn anything when I talk to people I agree with 100 percent, quite frankly. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I need someone to 
to look at my viewpoint occasionally and go, you know, I'm not sure you're right on this. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I, I, I think that there are real possibilities to do that. And uh, so, yeah, I, I really that's why I really am committed to trying to bring diverse voices into this conversation. Um, plus, I wouldn't be uh, the Christian I am today if I hadn't spent you know, time in a Middle Eastern country learning from my Muslim uh, siblings. I wouldn't be the Christian I am today if I hadn't spent time sitting down and having deep conversations with my uh, siblings of no faith tradition. Right. You know, these are, I think that's really important, important that uh, we come to the table as who we are on the whole and with the goal of helping each other to be stronger in uh, our own faith tradition. Do you think this is an issue in progressive Christianity? Because, you know, sometimes I feel like, and, and I've, I've mentioned this before, actually in the very first This Week in Heresy with my wife, is that, you know, there's a tendency to be so open and inclusive that you tend to wash everything and water everything down. I think that's true. I'll give you a real example of that. Um, Progressive Christian communities have become really fond of using uh, the Sufi poet Rumi um, in worship services. And I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with him being there in worship services. But I do think we do a disservice to Rumi when we forget that uh, he was a Muslim man and his perspective comes from the Muslim perspective. I want to honor that perspective. And I think it has a lot to teach us as progressive Christians. I think Rumi has a ton. I've learned a ton about the divine from Rumi, but I also have to honor first and foremost that his voice comes from his point of view. And I think, uh, in progressive communities, we have a bad habit of saying, Oh, it's all the same. Mm. Um, and I think there's a real privilege in that, especially among progressive Christians. I think there's a Christian privilege in that of saying, oh, it's all the same. I think that can become, uh, when you talk to someone of a different faith that can come become patronizing and saying, oh yeah, you believe the same thing I do. And I'm saying, wait, I don't have my voice heard. Mm -hmm. Um, so instead I prefer to say, No, it's not all the same, but we can learn from one another. We're all on a journey together. We are traveling companions, Mm -hmm. but it's not exactly the same journey. We have to uh, uh, respect each other, sing each other's songs, learn each other's songs, learn each other's prayers. But we also have to respect that we aren't always going to come to the same conclusion on anything. And, you know, that's okay. It's okay for us not to agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's one of the big things that gets missed in a lot of progressive movements in general is that, you know, it's okay to disagree and like, you don't, you know, to be active in social justice and all of the other ideals that the progressive movement really espouses you know you don't have to agree a hundred percent you don't have to be doing exactly what somebody else is doing to be a true progressive you know and all of that yeah you know the progressive movement's as bad as anyone about defining who's the in (laughs) crowd and who's the out crowd who are the real progressives who are the real liberals you know that kind of rhetoric is just not helpful Mm -hmm. and I think in a lot of ways we lose our voice because we're too busy eating each other alive Mm -hmm. instead of letting each other have each other's own uh, stance and saying, well, I may not agree with this piece of what you said, but I stand behind you because of who you are. So Mm -hmm. I think there's a solidarity element we often miss (laughs) because of that. Well, I also think the other problem, the other, the flip side of that is that if I think if you are saying that to somebody like, you know, you're you're not a true blank because of blank, you know, you're not listening to the other side. Exactly. So, you know, like, you know, when I was in I I went to the protests in New York in 2004 (laughs) and I got (laughs) arrested and it was a very hellish 
three days in New York city jail, sure. <laughs> not fun. And, you know, I can sympathize with the people that got jailed <laughs> in the recent protests right. and anybody who has, um, but I cannot sympathize as a black American and, but that doesn't make me any less of an activist because I can't do that. You know, it doesn't make me any less of an activist because I'm, you know, this is what I'm doing. You know, this podcast, my writing and stuff is what my activism is. And I think, I think we lose, I think in the regressive movement, we lose sight of that. Oh yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I was, I was having a conversation about this just the other day. Um, and I was thinking about even how hard it is to use language around this exact topic. You know, uh, particularly I was thinking about uh, the the current movement um, of uh, marching for racial uh, equality and against uh, brutality and, and, well, the Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, I was trying to figure out how to use the word because there was part of me that wanted to, to say, well, because this is a concern to my uh, friends who are persons of color, it is my concern, too. Yet the stakes are different for me as a uh, white person with privilege. Uh, I, I have to recognize that. So I have to say that even though it's because I think there are still stakes involved, uh, deep important stakes involved for me that I walk out in the street. I also have to step back to make sure I'm not co-opting the space from uh, other people who have uh, real, their lives are on the line in the midst of this. So I think my job, particularly as, as an activist within that setting, is uh, to step back and allow space for persons of color to have their voices heard. Um, and, and I, I think that, you know, again, I think that goes back to this whole idea that um, we have to be able to listen to one another. And I don't think we're particular. I think we're real good at talking and not very good at listening. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, it, it gets really frustrating to me because it's like, you know, it's like, yep, 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 yep. And then somebody goes off and does something and it's like, okay, where do I fit in with this movement? If I'm not doing what you think I should be doing. Uh, right. I, I, you know, I, I totally understand. It's been, it's been really interesting to watch uh, for me as people try to, to come to terms with that idea of saying, well, where do I fit in, in this movement and where should I fit in, in this movement? You know, um, and I think that's something that uh, to bring it back around to kind of talking about spiritual uh, development, spiritual formation. That's why I think that's an important piece to activism is that spiritual formation prayer allows us a time to reflect and ask ourselves, are we standing where we need to be standing at this moment in time and to reflect and go, um, you know, for me, it's been reflect on my privilege and ask the question, okay, so I, I want to stand in solidarity in this, but how do I, uh, using my faith resources, do that in a way that uh, allows space for those who truly don't have a voice to voice it instead okay. of uh, it being my voice out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. So, yeah, so that's part of why I really think, to bring it back around to spiritual formation, that's why I think spiritual formation is so important because it provides us a place to reflect, to discern, and to grow in who we are in light of the divine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important. I, I agree. I mean, <laughs> I feel like a slacker lately just because – my own spiritual work, you know, I, you know, it was kind of not put on hold, but put on hold during seminary. Cause they, you know, it's busy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now I'm really, you know, now that I've graduated, I'm really coming, kind of coming back around trying to figure out what 
my spirituality entails now because I've combined traditions. And, you know, you you had mentioned earlier about an interfaith component to your ministry. And, you know, where would somebody like me or like my church fit into yeah. that movement? And, and I'm hoping that will grow organically. I'm not sure <laughs> right now <laughs> how that's going to work. Uh, a lot of what I'm doing, I'm really, I'm really intentionally trying to let this, uh, ministry grow in an organic way. Um, I, I, I think it's becoming uh, right now. And it, it, I think it will change and shift. Um, I, I, I think one of the things uh, is part of the reason I've, I've put it out like I have is part of the reason I'm really intentional about wanting other voices and wanting community partners and things like that there's a way that a website like this can easily become ego. Yeah, <laughs> and, I understand. And, and, and I'm trying to be real intentional about that to make sure that this is not me stroking my ego and it all being my voice out there. That's not what I want. What I want is a diverse resource uh, out there. And so, yeah, uh, I'm being real intentional to try to make it organic for that reason. And uh, why I want to particularly partner with congregations uh, is because I want what is on the website to reflect the life of the congregations that I partner with. So depending on who the, the partners are going to be, the site will look a little differently because it will be growing out of the experience of who those congregations are. Mm -hmm. Um so, so you'll you, that will be what will be found on there will be much more about who the partners are. Um, like any ministry, it's about the context you're doing it in. Um, as much as I'd love to be everything to everyone, right. <laughs> there's no real way to do that. So, my hope is to really uh reflect the lived life of faith of the congregations. Uh, that the site uh, partners with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important. And I, you know, and I totally understand what you were saying about how spiritual practices uh, change and morph. You know, I really discovered this uh, as I went through my uh, cancer diagnosis last year for your, for those of you our listeners who uh, don't know me or watchers or whatever viewers <laughs> who don't know me. <laughs> I had, yeah, I had half of my, uh, my jaw removed, uh, last year due to cancer. Uh, I thank God cancer free Excellent. now, but I'm still trying to figure out what the new normal is. And during that time, my spiritual practice, the only thing I could do was say the rosary. That was my spiritual practice. Right. Um, and it's become a practice since then. But that's part of why a site like this, I think, is important, because I would like to uh, give people new resources and new spiritual practices. So when their old spiritual practice doesn't work for them anymore, mm -hmm. maybe they can find something new or maybe it's working for them, but they want to try something different. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, not every spiritual practice works for every person. Uh, it, it just isn't that way. Mm -hmm. But uh, if. I think there are lots of spiritual practices out there that are really good for people to try and maybe they can find what their passion is. So that's what I'm interested in resources, resourcing the people. I have no interest in reflecting uh, just what are the things that interest me. I want people to find their passions and reflect mm -hmm. their passions into the world. Um, and, and I think that's how I view ministry uh, as a whole. Ministry is not about uh, me somehow uh, telling people who the divine is, it's about helping people to discover whom they, where, whom and where they define the divine. Right. And I want to open up space that that may be an entirely different place than I do. So how, do, um, I know we, we touched a little bit about doctrine earlier, uh -huh. but, you know, given that ideal, how do you get around the doctrine issue? Uh, I Well, I think the doctrine, and I think it's a challenging one. Um, I think the first thing is 
I want I, you start by telling your writers come from where you are. Um, and that's what I am telling every one of the folks who is contributing is what is on your mind, where you are at. That's where you need to come from. Um, so doctrine wise, not everyone's going to agree. There are going to be things on my site that I don't agree with. <laughs> and I, I hope that's uh, the case. Um, you know, it's a risky thing sometimes, uh, doctrine wise, especially uh, as a person who is in the candidacy process of, of ministry, that doctrine somehow is used, to, uh, it can be used in that way. But my hope is we find uh, common places to uh, stand, even though doctrine is different. And that's why I want each of the writers to come from the doctrine that is in their heart. Mm -hmm. um, because I want people, Another important part of what I think spiritual uh, formation and reflection are about is about where can I stand faith-wise? Where is that grounded spot? And uh, so finding that grounded spot uh, and speaking from there. So in some ways, I am... Hope uh, I'm saying we have to live with the tension of doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think, uh, you know, each of our denomination, every denomination of people can uh, deal with the issues within their denomination differently. And uh, so I think that hopefully what can happen is we can find a common place to stand yet at the same time. Uh, be who we are authentically. And so for uh, authenticity purposes, I think uh, doctrine is a kind of a secondary piece of what I'm doing right now, though I'm really committed to be uh, this being a progressive space. Right. So, so even by saying that I am filtering out myself, even, even with the lofty ideals I'm talking about, you're making decisions as to what, mm -hmm. where you put things. And, and that's not a bad thing either. But uh, my hope is that by helping people to come from their authentic space, that even if we can't agree on doctrine, we can at least know where each other are coming from. Mm -hmm. And I think that's half the battle is if we can understand why people believe what they do. Mm -hmm. then it's easier to be in conversation with each other and to have uh, care for one another. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I think that's an interesting point. Like, you know, and, and, and it goes right back to being able to listen and, you know, being able to hear somebody else's story, I think. Well, and I think, and I think that's the key, you know, um, I, I've done real interesting reading lately about, uh, social justice in general and how narrative in particular is a really effective tool for social transformation. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is, is we can talk, uh, facts, figures all day, but as soon as a human person is in front of us, telling us what they really believe and we really hear them, then it's harder to dismiss them as something else, as an enemy or mm -hmm. another. Because they're not. <laughs> they're, they're another right. human being. I think that's a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge to really see one another as human beings, but I think it's our challenge. Uh, once we do it, uh, we are able to look at each other and say, you're not my enemy. You are a person whose beliefs come from a real place. Um, and I think it's easier to have compassion, even if we disagree with beliefs, if we can see that they come from an honest place. So uh, I think whenever we talk doctrine, if we talk authenticity along with doctrine, then we're coming from the right location. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the, the deals we have to all be coming from an authentic place instead of trying to shape ourselves into uh, doctrine, too, which is another challenge. Doctrine has a way of 
uh, making us shape ourselves into that doctrine and instead of us living out of that doctrine. So I think we should live out of the doctrine and not try to contort ourselves into doctrine. Mm-hmm. UMC is one of the denominations and they're having a really difficult time with um, issues around homosexuality and others in sexuality and all that. And, you know, I, I think there might be some people who might see UMC on your website and be like, oh, dude, mm-hmm. <laughs> dude, I ain't going there. And, you know, what I mean, how would you respond to that if somebody emailed you and said, hey, you know, why do you have a UMC people? They they don't like gays. Yeah. Well, and, and I and the place I would come directly from that. So UMC is, is my home denomination. Mm-hmm. I am a United Methodist. It is where I come from. I disagree deeply with uh, the line in the Book of Discipline uh, that speaks about uh it speaks about uh, homosexuality, uh, homosexuality being incompatible with Christian teaching. I just think it's an inconscionable thing for us to have in our discipline. That being said, um, mm-hmm. I think that. Um, so I've struggled with uh, continuing because of this reason, continuing to be a part of the UMC church, the United Methodist Church. But I find uh so much of the rest of the history and doctrine of the church speaks directly to my heart. That that's where I stay. And so I'm coming from my authentic place within that. Um, but I'm also being really intentional, particularly within there to discern, uh, particularly the dissenting voices. So the, Re- uh, the reconciling ministries network who again, committed to United Methodist network, but also committed to, uh, advocacy for full inclusion um so i understand and i understand if a person says you know what i can't be anywhere near something that is that i if it makes if it makes a person that uncomfortable uh then i uh say i understand you know for first off i want to hear the person say boy i'm not gonna touch it i'm gonna go yeah here's why i think you should but my first answer is if it makes you feel shame or pain or anything then you need not to be connected in that way you know in that way so i think dissent is important and i think it's important for there to be loyal dissent um because it allows those who disagree so those within the united Methodist church who disagree with me to still say well, he is a United Methodist, um, and maybe it helps them to say, let's look at this from a different perspective. So I think that, again, uh, is important, even if there are challenges within doctrinal systems, uh, that people come from where they're at, because that's how change happens. Again, mm-hmm narrative within the doctrine. I have one thing um, I'm working on and I haven't finished yet is I have spent a good bit of time looking at uh, queer theology within the United Methodist uh, context. And I think that one can make a a United Methodist argument for uh, a queer understanding uh, and worldview. And I think that's important. We need queer United Methodist uh, theology. We need queer Catholic theology. We need queer pagan theology. Right, right. You know, so by a lot, even though doctrine may be a challenge within those situations, by having that, uh, the dissenting loyal voices, that's who I want to focus on is those who come, have, have a place to stand and come from it. Um, because I think that's an important thing. Again, my goal with this website is one of the things uh, when I started that was a real challenge in my head was I don't want to drive people out of churches. I want to help people get into churches because I uh, or worship. I don't want to use the word churches. I want to use the word worship and communities. Yeah, uh, because I think that's it's not just about Christianity. I, my hope is the site gets people connected within community because I think community is so important to the faith journey. 
Um, and for that reason, it, it's important to allow people uh, to bring the voices to stand from where they're standing. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's a ten- again, I think there's a tension there, but I've chosen the route of sitting with the tension as opposed to ignoring it, because I think we have to sit with that tension. Well, and, and, you know, and through your website, you know, people can see that the UMC is not monolithic. Yeah. You know? And I and, and that's an argument I have with a lot of people, especially around Christianity as a whole. It's like, you know, there are progressive Christians. There are Christians that want social justice. There are Christians that want gay rights. There are Christians that want marriage equality. There are Christians that want diversity and radical inclusion. And, you know, it's it's trying to explain that it's not a monolith. Yeah, I, I you know. I think that's a really important thing because, uh, you know, I have lots of friends who uh, self-identify as atheists or agnostic, and most of the folks I know who identify as atheists or agnostic are rejecting a god or a, an idea of the divine that I myself would reject. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that's important to remember that I could no easier believe in what they, their understanding of what the divine is. I could no easier believe in if that was what my understanding of what the divine was. Yeah. Absolutely. I just have a different understanding. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think this kind of conversation is important because if I can understand where they're coming from and they can understand where I'm coming from, then we can, uh, actually work together and uh, make positive change in this world as opposed to continually getting wrapped up around trying to convince. That's the other thing. I want it to be a conversation and not an attempt to convince one another that right. they're right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> too, too often we get uh, get wrapped up in trying to convince one another we're right. <laughs> and yeah, uh, as opposed to having the conversation, as a, and if we have the conversation, I think we actually find more common ground. Um, so it's about what is our um, our uh, motivation for relationship. You know, if we go into a relationship with the idea that we're con- going to convince the other person they're wrong, that is not a real relationship. If we're going to have true relationship, we have to allow space for the other person to be that other person. Right. Um, and that's not easy. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Because, you know, there's times where I'm just like, I just want to be right. Darn oh. it. <laughs> You know, and, and as, a, as a person who's been married for 10 years, I can tell you that goes even into relationships <laughs> of, of uh, you know, romantic relationships as well. Yep, absolutely. You know, <laughs> so I think that's that's a hard thing to, to learn. And again, is part of why I've structured the site the way I have is to try to allow the site is really an attempt to try to allow for space where people can listen. Um, and I'm really trying to, to provide a space to amplify voices that, so they can be heard. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's my hope. You know, who, who knows what it becomes in the long run, but we'll see. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to take the journey with it. Well, I'm excited too, because, you know, it seems like at least from my experience and my seeing of what people in seminary are doing now, it's more about amplifying voice yep. and, you know, the, the projects like mine, projects like yours, it, it, it seems like the new crop of seminary students are being, are like, listen, we need to amplify these voices and we need to bring these voices out, especially in the progressive movement. And I think, I think it's really exciting. I, I agree too. You know, the thing is I, I have a, a friend who often, uh, says that people are literally dying to hear some good news out there. And it is true. It is true. And I think uh, because of loaded words like evangelism and mm-hmm. loaded words like, uh, you know, lo- loaded ideas and a history of colonialism within Christianity and a history of being a uh, patriarchal. Uh, 
heteronormative uh, history, because we have that history, um, we don't tend to, to want to sometimes speak out as loud. Um, but I think it's important that progressive voices be out there. And I think it's important that voices be out there saying, look, this is what I've found. You don't have to find it in exactly the same way I found it. You don't have to find the exact same thing I found. But I want to go on this journey with you because there's a real, there's really something that's touching my heart. And that, and that's the sentiment I want to get at is where is our heart? Where is our mind and where are our souls being touched right now? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really the goal of the site is to, that's uh, why the name is the found altar. Mm -hmm. And the found altar is the idea that an altar isn't just in a church. We find altars everywhere in our life mm -hmm. um, and everywhere we go. And uh, I, I say in the site itself that we often stumble upon those altars. Absolutely. And uh, so my goal is to, with the site in a lot of ways is once someone has stumbled upon an altar of their own to share that altar with others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think you're right. And it's interesting that it's online and, you know, I've, I've seen articles here and there saying, Oh, you can't have church online because of, you know, you need physical community. And I'm just like, but it is a community. And that's why I know, like for me, and I, you know, and this is, this is one thing I'm totally with you on being an online thing is that, you know, there is a community online that would want this kind of spiritual community, but can't have it because of one reason or another, like location or, you know, family of origin or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the reasons I really think online is an important piece of it is while I want, uh, people where they can to have that uh, physical community. Uh, I also want the voice to be out there. You know, I would love when I was in my teens before I discovered the writings of Marcus Borg as an example, to know that someone thought about Christianity <laughs> the way I did. Right. And I wasn't just sitting there out on my own crazy, you know, mm -hmm. that um, so I think online resources like this function in that way that can drive people to communities that they can be more uh, physically involved in, hopefully. Um, and, and that's why I want it to be both online and offline. Um, also, I'm hoping to build a community. One of the reasons I want to do multiple partner churches is churches are very bad about building community with one another. If that makes right, sense. Right. Um, there is a tradition of that within United Methodist, uh, Methodism called connectionalism. I don't think we're very good at it anymore. <laughs> um, on the whole, I would like us to be more uh, with it uh, mm -hmm. on connectionalism. But the reason I'm, I want to partner with communities is in the long run, I hope these communities become closer with one another. Um, and uh, particularly because I've decided I want this to be across denominational lines. I hope that uh, geo geographic, uh, I'm hoping these communities, which are geographically close, will learn ways to share resources across denominational lines and across, uh, uh, and across the street, you know, so that they might actually serve the communities they're in better. Um, right. And, you know, again, I don't think there's any reason why the UCC's uh, church and the United Methodist Church that are a block away from each other need to be considering themselves in competition. <laughs> uh, in fact, I think instead they ought to be helping one another out to uh, get the people who fit best with the ethos of those churches in those pews. So if a person comes to the United Methodist Church and, and talks to the pastor and talks about it being, uh, this is, I'm looking for something X, Y, and Z. And the pastor goes, you know, that sounds really like the church down the street. You ought to check them out too. Mm -hmm. So I think we should do that. <laughs> I think we should be in the business, not of attempting to fill just our views, but get people connected with the communities they belong connected to. 
I agree. And with that, we are out of time. Oh, wow. This uh, is a great conversation. Yeah, it has been fantastic. So um, where can people find you if they want to talk, ask you questions and um, the found altar? Yeah. So the website is www.thefoundaltar.com. You can also find it at Facebook. Just search The Found Altar on the Facebook engine. Um, you'll find it there. Uh, my name is Chris Hockley. You can find me uh, in some of those ways, too. And email, if you need to email me, email me at thefoundaltar at gmail.com. All right. Well, we'll have all that in the show notes and, you know, links to everything. That'd be uh, great. As usual. <laughs> and um, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to uh a joy to get to be on uh, someone else's uh, little project. And I'm really, uh, really, really uh, happy to see the success of uh, this week in Harrisby. It's been great to have. Well, thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I'd like to thank Chris for joining us this week. As always, if you have comments, questions, or would like to read the show notes, you can go to thisweekinheresy.com. You can support This Week in Heresy by subscribing to the show via iTunes or the Stitcher app, joining our forums, following us on Twitter at TWIH Podcast, or financially through Patreon. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next time.